one was kind of like, we can fix this. It's not fixing it, it's just dealing with, you know, the way she is. The journey that he's been on, and us as a family as well, it's just been incredible, really. I don't want to kind of like advocate and say like amputating is the best thing to do because it's it's individual for everybody I think um, but for me it was the best thing like I think having my leg amputated was the best thing I ever chose to do. So after the 20 week scan that was when they diagnosed her with fibula hemimelia. She only had three toes and she had quite quite a good difference on her leg. Yeah, when we first found out it was a shock. But then more and more down the line when we spoke to doctors and stuff we sort of just came to terms with it and told us it was normal. A child can have a birth defect with a short leg, but could be having five toes, could be having three toes or two toes. The question at the end of the day is, we could reconstruct this leg or limb, but probably the terminal end organ, which is the foot, needs to have a good platform to stand on and continue for the rest of their life. So a decision has to be made in difficult situations if one cannot reconstruct or lengthen the leg and keep the joints and the foot in good shape, then probably there is an indication to discuss about planned amputation with the family. We normally make sure that our children, when we decide for planned amputation, the family gets an informed choice whether uh, amputation is the right way to treat or whether reconstructive options are possible. Uh, I think the top questions probably from families, of course, is whether they are making the right decision. And many of them do ask whether later on in adulthood, whether the child will regret the choice. And in my experience, I've been an orthopedic surgeon for 35 years, I've yet to find any child later on become an adult complaining anything about the decision making. Yeah, I mean, we discussed both the options. I think we, after we knew what she had, um, we started looking into it quite a lot. Um, we were given both options, but from reading so much, we, I think we kind of already decided in our head before even speaking to most people what we were going to do. So we were in hospital. Um, Layla had her amputation two days ago. Um, I think we both felt pretty calm about the whole situation just because we were fully aware of what was happening. Um, we knew kind of months and months ago that this is what was gonna happen and we wanted to go for the amputation. I think the worst part was when she actually had to go to sleep, when they put the mask on her face, that was the worst part. And that was the only time I actually cried. <laughs> Other than that, she's been absolutely fine. So they're, they're changing her dressing after six days, checking the wound is, is okay, um, and then another two and a bit weeks after that we'll come back um, and they'll start measuring up for her prosthesis. Hi, Hi. So we're just trying to mark out where the anatomy is. Right, okay. So we just need to know where everything is so that we can make sure we're not putting any excess pressure on the bones. Yeah. This is the crest of the tibia. That's the underside of a flare on a bone. Just there, so we know where we can load to these, the areas to the side, are areas that we can, that will tolerate pressure. Right. Are you ready? Keep the turkey. Yeah. Go on. Just the worst part. Oh, it's coming, it's coming. There, there you go. go. The reason we use that is because it transfers onto the positive cast. Oh, right, okay. In Can the right go? place. Ideal time for fitment or the first trial of measuring prosthesis is somewhere between six to eight weeks. Uh, but prior to doing the first trial, we usually like the stump to shrink 
and at least it takes six weeks for that process to happen. And when they go first and meet the prosthetist and they get the first trial done or measurement done for the prosthesis, then you get a better fit. Excited. <laughs> what are you nervous about? Well, I don't know, just starting the new journey of him walking again. I'm just about, about to have a look at the tip of the skin flap to make sure that this is here and then hopefully refit the prosthesis to make things even, even quicker. Yeah. Do you feel it's here? Do you feel it's touching you here? And here? Yeah. Good, so we have good feeling around the ulcer, so that's, that's a good sign. So you feel all that here? Yeah. Very good, very good, well done. Most of the children, the younger they are, they usually are in the hospital, not more than two to three days, maybe three days uh, to four maximum. Uh, the older children probably are the ones who have been previously treated. They might have some chronic pain. Probably they might take anyway up to seven days uh, minimum, yeah. Roll that right up, up right, that's it. Keep that wide for now. How does that feel? Good. My name is Jude Hamer um, and I am a two-time wheelchair basketball Paralympian. I graduated in November of 2019 um, with my master's degree in pharmacology and biotechnology um, and before that I did an undergraduate degree in biochemistry. And so I was born with PFFD. My parents tried to find um, treatment options for me and a consultant suggested um, amputating and being their firstborn my parents just couldn't accept that as like the only option for me and I think it just felt quite dramatic to them to do that without, without having looked at what else could could help me. And my mum at that point did some research and found out about Professor Sali at Sheffield Children's Hospital. Um, and we met him and he introduced the concept of leg lengthening to us. Um, and that was the decision my parents made was to try and um, lengthen my leg. I've lost count of my surgeries. I honestly don't know how many I've had now. From the age of 18 months to 15, I think it was 25 surgeries. Um, it was just getting more and more painful over time. And like my mum would have to come in in the middle of the night because I was like crying in pain in my sleep. And after a while, she was like, "We have to get this looked at. This isn't normal. Like for you to be in this much pain, like you've had it three like three times now." And, and my hip was dislocated, and it wasn't just like dislocated because my hips not formed properly. It was like out of the socket and around the back of my pelvis. And they said to me. It'll be really difficult now to lengthen your leg 
because of the fragility around your hip. And my mum at that point said to them, well, what about amputating? Um, and I kind of just like stopped listening at that point because I just didn't want to hear it. Like quite soon after leaving, I actually thought, actually, that's probably quite a good idea. Like I'm, you know, about to do my GCSEs. I'm in that hospital all the time, like 25 times. I'm constantly going to the hospital for appointments. I never, like, never get a summer holiday because I'm always in hospital. I don't ever get to do like normal kid things because I've constantly got to worry about my leg. I'm always in pain. I was like, actually, it's probably better for me to have that done. I went and talked to prosthetists about the options for my leg and I talked to different doctors about different amputations and what would be better for me. And I chose to have a transtibial amputation in the end. And at that point, when I chose to have it done, leg lengthening wasn't working for me anymore. And I think having my leg amputated was the best thing I ever chose to do. I think I would have never gone into basketball if I hadn't chosen to amputate. Um, maybe I'd have still gone to university, but maybe I'd have done medicine instead. Like I'll never know. But it didn't. It hasn't uh, like made my life worse for choosing to have a leg a leg amputation. Um, I think it just gave me options that I wouldn't. I didn't feel were open to me before. What kind of prosthesis will my child have? They'll have the one that's appropriate for their level of amputation and it'll be considered carefully by the multidisciplinary team. So there's input from the doctor, the physiotherapist, occupational therapist, prosthetist, parents, the child themselves. That's the team. Well, we do try and prioritise for children and um, at this centre we would aim to cast as soon as possible and manufacture the limb within one to two weeks and deliver the prosthesis ready for rehabilitation either at that stage or one or two weeks after that. So within, within a month you should be up and running within the parallel bars with a physiotherapist and learning to walk. Can you pull the sword? Yeah. Oh no! Oh no! Oh, girl! Was he hungry? Oh. Like Adam was saying, that bar underneath the knee, that yeah. looks fine. Put the way it went on. Right, okay. So how did it go today? Yeah, everything went really well. Um, the first time she put it on, she took to it really well. But yeah, she was walking up and down, enjoying it. And it was just nice to finally, finally have a leg for her to learn to walk, really. Yeah. Get her up and going, finally. I think a lot of people, when I look on different groups, there's a lot of anti-amputation. And I think, I think people think it's a really bad thing. What she does now, what she's capable of, to us, we've, we've made the right decision because she, yeah, I think she's off running. Anything, she, nothing stops her. As soon as you find out um, if, if your child has fibular hemomelia or any other lower limb disability, to, to get in contact with Steps. They've got loads of people that you can reach out to. The first time I ever rang Steps, I think I was on, on the phone for about an hour and a half. <laughs> and um, silly questions that you don't really think you need to know or you don't know who else to ask. So speaking to other parents that have gone through it that are part of Steps it really gives you a bit of an insight it's just really helpful to be able to go to somebody um, because the doctors aren't at the end of the phone for you. It's nice to have a contact um, that you can ring up, text, whatever, email um, and they're there at the end of the phone 